Chapter 221 The Terror Club at a Higher Level The Blue Avenger was like a leaf on the surface of the undulating waves of the Sonya Sea. At times, it was raised high and sometimes low from the ebbing of the waves, but there was no sign of it being at risk of capsizing. Alger Wilson stood in the captain cabin, his back to the shelves of red and white wine, as he subconsciously paced around. Finally, he gritted his teeth and returned to the mahogany desk with a grim expression. He removed the brass sextant, found a piece of paper and pen, and leaned over to draw the complex, mysterious symbol given to him by the fool. With the seafarer's memory, Alger quickly completed the first step of the sacrificial ritual. Then, he opened the drawer and took out a candle. He set up the ritual according to the dualism principles and placed the candle above the symbol that was formed by the combination of the pupilless eye and the partial contorted lines. One candle was placed in the middle that represented the person making the sacrifice. After cleaning up all the items on the table, Alger condensed pure water in the palm of his hand and wiped the altar clean. He then used the silver dagger from the ceremony to create a ceiling wall that surrounded his desk. After doing all this, he used his spirituality to light up the two candles and retreated a few steps under the dim light. Taking a deep breath, Alger lowered his head and recited in ancient Hermes. <sighs> the fool that doesn't belong to this era. You are the mysterious ruler above the gray fog. You are the king of yellow and black who wields good luck. Your devoted servant prays for your attention. I pray for you to take his offerings. I pray for you to open the gates to your kingdom. This ancient incantation reverberated within the wall of spirituality, stirring up spiraling gales as they swept forth with the force of nature. It was the oldest sacrificial language created by human beyonders, and it contained many mysteries itself. However, it lacked sufficient protection for the user. Bearing with the pain that was akin to having knives slicing across his skin, Alger took out a small dark brown glass bottle from his pocket, unscrewed the lid, and poured out a lot of sesame-shaped granules. These granules swirled with a metallic luster and exuded an indescribable sense of beauty. Alger scattered these granules into the wind. <sighs> the gale grew stronger, but was no longer tempestuous. It was dyed in two separate colors, silver and black. As they continued to collide and mix, the two differently colored winds were infused into the candle flame that symbolized the fool, burgeoning and tearing open an illusory ordinary-sized door. Its surface was carved with the same symbol that Alder had drawn. At this moment, Klein witnessed the appearance of the hazy door behind his high back chair. He could feel the spirituality in the air that was rippling apart and stimulating the mysterious space. It seems to be working. Klein suddenly had a premonition and immediately spread out his spirituality, infusing it with upheavals and stimulation. Creak. Amidst the insubstantial sounds, the blurry door slowly opened. In the captain cabin, Alger suddenly saw the illusory door, formed out of wind and light, open. Behind it was deep darkness formed from an innumerable amount of almost invisible shadows. They were lustrous splendors encompassing massive amounts of knowledge. Situated above them was the thick gray fog with the ancient palace overlooking the real world. Such a scene caused Alger to involuntarily tremble. It was a deep fear, an indescribable excitement. He hurriedly picked up the rainbow salamander's pituitary gland that he had long prepared. He held it with both hands, and with his head bowed, he raised the palm-sized object which was constantly changing in color, and had a soft feel to the ridges to the illusory door. Alger's hands grew lighter under the sudden appearance and instant disappearance of a suction force. He lost the slight tingling sensation that the rainbow salamander's pituitary gland gave him. He didn't dare raise his head until he heard the deep voice of the fool echoing in his ears. You did well. It's my honor, Alger answered without any hesitation. He looked ahead again, only to see that the illusory door had disappeared. 
the gale had stopped and the candle flames had returned to their original state. After the candles were extinguished according to the normal procedures, Audra sat down with a complicated expression and said to himself silently, In the beginning, only people could be pulled into the world above the gray fog. After a while, responses could be made by listening to prayers. Now, sacrifices and bestowments can be performed. Mr. Fool is freeing himself from his predicament one step at a time, and bit by bit, will he enter the real world. This guess or conclusion frightened and worried Alger, but he also felt a bit of delight. At least I'm a member of the Terror Club, one of the earliest members. Ah, <sighs> he sighed. In the majestic palace above the Grey Fog, Klein was playing with the pituitary gland of the rainbow salamander. Various colors were reflected on his face as they constantly changed colors. A slight tingling sensation came from his palm, and a strong sense of accomplishment filled his heart, causing him to reveal a genuine smile. In the future, the Terra Club will become even more miraculous. After reflecting over the situation, Klein extended his spirituality and sent his will to the Crimson Star representing Miss Justice. After returning to her bedroom, Audrey was no longer able to sit quietly on the edge of the bed. She would restlessly flip through the books by her bed and from time to time scrutinize herself in the mirror with an unfocused gaze. She was looking forward to the completion of the hanged man's sacrificial ritual, but she was also afraid that the result would be a failure. Emperor Roselle had said that one must remain calm and collected when important matters arise. Audrey, come on. Take a deep breath. <sighs> or perhaps I should go tease the dog. However, Susie can talk and think, so she's an entity with her own dignity. I can't just casually tease her. Audrey's mind wandered her hand unconsciously wringing an ornate doll dressed in splendid clothing. After an unknown period of time, a thick gray fog suddenly appeared before her eyes, and in the depths of the fog, there was a lofty chair. Sitting there, the fool said with a smile, Miss Justice, the attempt was successful. Have you prepared the materials that contain spirituality? That's great, as expected of Mr. Fool. Audrey forgot the hanged man's role in this matter. She held back her excitement and said, Yes, I always have such materials with me. Audrey had been the same even before she joined the Terra Club, but back then, she didn't know which materials could be considered to contain spirituality. She had merely moved them from the family treasury in accordance with the various essential oil formulas she had gathered. Klein nodded slightly and said, When do you plan on holding the ritual? This is based on the premise that there are no Beyonders around you. Does a Beyonder dog count? Audrey looked at the tightly shut door, feeling a small tug at her conscience. I can do it now. Klein tersely acknowledged. The ritual's process is the same as I described previously. All you need to do is change the prayer to Your devoted servant prays for your attention. I pray for you to open the gates to your kingdom. I pray for you to give me strength. In addition to this, use the dualism method. Audrey thought it over, fighting the urge to nod, and she began preparing for the ritual. When the illusory door opened and a scene even more illusory than the cosmos appeared, Audrey felt intoxicated in both body and mind. This is the mysterious world I've always been pursuing. This is the kind of feeling I've always wanted. She praised Mr. Fool wholeheartedly. It's faith towards the goddess, but for the fool, it's worship. Audrey silently explained herself in her mind. Soon after, she was stunned to see that there was something on the altar. It was a soft object with lustrous color and was filled with ridges. The rainbow salamander's pituitary gland. Audrey felt a surge of joy in her heart. Her eyes lit up as she had the urge to step forward and grab it. However, her customs of etiquette took hold of her as she sincerely praised Mr. Fool once again. After finishing the ritual, 
She impatiently walked forward and carefully examined the Beyond the Material five times. Our turret club is at a higher level than all the other secret organizations. Audrey secretly felt smug. She then glanced warily at the door, as if afraid of Susie's sudden intrusion. She had to redouble her efforts and immediately concoct the potion to complete her advancement. A few minutes later, she held a bottle of liquid that contained constantly changing lusters that could shine to the bottom of everyone's hearts. She successfully drank the telepathist potion and successfully tied it through the integration stage with the Beyonder characteristics, achieving an advancement. The view before her seemed to clear up significantly, with a great increase in other aspects. Audrey familiarly used cogitation to restrain the dissipating spirituality. After her sequence stabilized, she smiled and walked briskly to the door, letting in the golden retriever. She saw the obvious suspicion on Susie's face. You took far longer than usual. Susie didn't hide her thoughts. Audrey sat down on an ottoman and dryly laughed before changing the subject. <laughs> Susie, tell me, how should I secretly inform Shio and Forrest about a particular matter without revealing myself, yet get them interested? Before she finished her sentence, Audrey had begun to seriously ponder over the mission Mr. Fool had assigned her. Then, she looked at Susie, and Susie looked back at her. The human and dog both fell into deep thought at the same moment. After completing his goal, Klein returned to reality, slept for a little more than an hour before hurrying out the door. He spent a pound to buy a pair of gold-rimmed glasses, wigs, and a variety of mustaches that could be torn off and stuck on with adhesives. They were disguises he would need later. Before dinner, he made a trip to Eastboro, the most crowded area and the most unsafe part of the city. He rented a one-bedroom house at the rent of four soli, three pence a week. He paid two weeks' rent and a deposit, coming up to a total of 17 soli. Only then did Klein complete all his early preparations. East Borough also left a deep impression on him. Most of the streets here were the same as Tingen's Lower Street, but the area that shared the traits was many times larger. The clothes of the residents here were old but decent. Many of them were dressed in shabby clothes with sallow skin and thin frames. It was as though they would turn into beasts at any moment due to their hunger or poverty. Therefore, gangs ran rampant in East Borough. When he got back to Sherwood Borough, Klein felt as if he had entered heaven from hell. For the next two days, he experimented with using his spirituality to perform the rituals and create charms. He no longer prayed to the goddess, and waited for the effects of his tiny advertisements to bear fruit. On Thursday morning, Klein finally heard the doorbell ring. Ding dong!